Greetings, and welcome to another official meeting of the Appalachian Mystery Society. I am joined here by the best Virginian. Hello. Am I coming through? Yep. All right. And then we are also joined by Micah. Hello. And the subject of this meeting is uh, essentially books that we enjoy. So each of us have chosen a book that we will discuss. So I will start with the books I've chosen. I've chosen two books. The first one is The Goblin Universe by Ted Holliday. This book discusses general philosophy about anomalous phenomena. He has a spiritual or paranormal perspective on the Loch Ness Monster, which is actually kind of a rare thing. Um, the only other book I've seen that talks about the Loch Ness Monster in that way would be uh, Nick Redfern's book Nessie, which came out like in the 2000s, 2010s. This book is from 1986, so this is like a classic one. And he discusses uh, the creature as sort of a manifestation. He talks about it avoiding cameras placed in the lock. The cover art has this gridded pattern of the Loch Ness Monster coming out of the grid. And just the cover art and the title alone really, I think, makes it fly off the shelf. It's exactly the kind of book that I would be looking for, the Goblin Universe, with this trippy-looking cover art. He talks about some surreal concepts, very Alice in Wonderland. The Hall of Mirrors is a concept he discusses in there as well. He talks about the UFO aspect of uh, Loch Ness. He also had a book called The Dragon and the Disc, which was the dragon being the Loch Ness Monster and the disc being the flying saucers. So he gets a lot into um, mythology and things like that. He talks a lot about what we would call high strangeness and has this big unified theory. Ted Holliday actually started off with a concept of the Loch Ness Monster as more of a worm-like thing. He didn't consider it paranormal at first. He thought it would be a natural animal, but later he evolved into this theory. And this book was actually published seven years after his death. It was a, it's a posthumous book. And he actually threw away the manuscript, but it was saved by Colin Wilson, who published it after his death. Ted Holliday, in his later years, actually went back on his ideas of the spiritual explanation of the Loch Ness Monster and returned to a more normal sort of uh, concept, like his worm idea. I learned about this book from a guest speaker, Steve Ward, at the Mothman Festival in 2017. According to Lauren Coleman in his book A through Z, the Goblin Universe as a concept was first used popularly in the 1972 book Bigfoot by John Napier, strangely enough, because that's like a book that you wouldn't expect to be the origin of that phrase because it's a, you know, a very flesh and blood Bigfoot book. Uh, you wouldn't expect a Bigfoot book to be the, the origin of that phrase, which then gets used generally for anomalous phenomena and for Loch Ness Monster and Ted Holliday. It's sort of a, a strange thing for that to be the origin. But um, I could try to explain the book more and the concepts, but it's really one of those books where you just kind of have to read it because it's it's a trip. Okay, so Best Virginian, can you talk about your book? Yeah, so the uh, book I decided is one that I had really just started reading a couple of weeks ago, and it is A Guide to Haunted West Virginia by Walter Gavinda and Mike Shoemaker. And it's more of a kind of a travel companion book, more so than a ghost story book, which is the one issue I had with the big book of West Virginia ghost stories. It wasn't quite a ghost story book, and it wasn't quite a travel companion book, but this one, it goes into the stories and then actually explains how to get to the areas where the paranormal activity uh, took place. And it has a lot of the kind of more obscure areas mentioned in a lot of other texts and things, uh, such as Priest Field and some of the paranormal activity around Harper's Ferry and rural uh, Wetzel County, which is where I initially grew up. And I really appreciate it because the uh, forward of it, it talks about the concept of parahistory, not so much the study of like paranormal history, but just the study of folklore and urban legends, um, things that kind of get left out when they start studying like mainstream um, history. There are certain elements that get left out for various reasons, and I really appreciated uh, that aspect of it because that's pretty much an explanation for what I've always tried doing uh, with West Virginia folklore and ghost stories and stuff like that. So in the foreword, they kind of explained what I've always tried explaining a little bit better than I've ever been able to. Okay, Micah? So the book I picked out was uh, the Strange West Virginia Monsters book by Michael Newton, uh, because 
I just like the fact that it has sightings from like mountain lions and like crocodiles and like just we just all around like really weird stuff that doesn't fall into like like there's so many books that talk about like Mothman or the Flatwoods, but I haven't really seemed to find like too many books that discuss stuff like just how many mountain lion sightings we have in the state for like a species that's supposed to be extinct. And that's uh really insanely interesting to me. There's stuff in it like a kangaroo sighting in Charleston. Alli- yeah, there was an alligator killed in uh, Lincoln County in 2010. No one knows like where it came from. It was probably a pet or something. But I'm fascinated by a lot of the uh, cougar sightings is like one of the main reasons that uh, I like this book so much. The book is divided into different sections of uh, types of creatures. Like section one is just uh, mountain lions. Section two is just like crocodiles and stuff. But there's a chapter called The Great Unknown, which is my favorite chapter in the book, where it talks about stuff that doesn't fit into like any other category when it comes to this stuff. So it's, it's really interesting. Like one of the things was like a uh, creature from the Black Lagoon type model monster that lives in the devil's hole which is a uh river i think but it's like weird stuff like that like this guy in bluefield claims he saw a gargoyle as a kid that's that's really interesting uh michael newton has written a lot of other books about cryptids in different states and um yeah that's that's it i actually have the the michael newton book on my shelf but i I haven't heard of the the book the best virginian brought up might be a book i should check out what you said best virginian though about how sometimes a book will put into words a concept you've been thinking about for a while. That's exactly that's exactly right with some of the books I've read. Uh, these people can put into words something that you struggle to put into words, and it just that's another good reason why it's good to look at these books about these subjects, is they can help you explain to everyone else what the heck you're talking about, you know what I mean? Now we can uh, sort of just discuss generally. I was saying before that I have uh, two books, because the first book I mentioned wasn't very Appalachian. So I picked the second one, which is Close Encounters at Kelly and Others of 1955 by the Center for UFO Studies. And this one covers the Kentucky Goblins and uh, has a lot of great sketches and photos. It's a very in-depth book. It goes into it very well. Uh, It takes the material very seriously, which is cool because a lot of people would see that as something more silly. So I just wanted to bring that up as well as a second book that is more Appalachian-centric because it's based in Kentucky. Popkinville Goblins are like my favorite cryptid right now. People often call them the the Kelly creatures or the Kelly Hopkinsville goblins or just the Hopkinsville goblins. There's a lot of different names for that case, but it's the 1955 case in uh, around Kelly and Hopkinsville in Kentucky. The book also features other general stuff in different states, I think in, in Ohio and stuff like that, other cases of UFO close encounters in 1955. I've got a lot of notes written down from the book, but they're mostly just uh, like sightings and stuff from the book that have been uh, the contents of the book. The whole phantom cats thing is a very famous phenomena that happens a lot in, or that people report on a lot in uh, Fortean spheres. There are sightings everywhere of uh, what we call out-of-place animals, which are just an animal that is not native to the region that doesn't make any sense for it to be there. Uh, John Keel went on David Letterman and talked about that back in the day. Phantom kangaroos is something that there's a whole chapter about in uh, Mysterious America. I also have another book called The World's Strangest Stories. It has a bunch of collections of Fate magazine articles, and there's stuff in there as well about the phantom kangaroos. But the cougars or panthers is also a a very common thing that people reportedly see and uh, actually know someone who said they saw a uh, panther walk out, like a black panther just walk out in front of the road near a fishing pier in Kanawha County. Um, It's the same fishing pier that I went to in one of my videos where there was supposedly a woman in white who was seen there, like, in the fall time. So some weird things going on near that fishing pier, I guess. Uh, There are power lines, but not much else to really make it all that interesting. But, yeah, the phantom kangaroos and phantom cats and out-of-place animals generally is a a phenomena that's been talked about since, like, the whole Fortean thing started going. My dad has claimed to actually have seen uh, Black Panther when he was younger around like the uh, either McDowell or Wyoming County area. And I can remember back in the 90s, there there were several accounts of out of place, like big cats being seen across the Midwest. Um, it was really like a regular occurrence that you'd hear about these big cat sightings. Just, you know, a giant panther or lion would just walk out of a cornfield and then disappear into another one right across the road. It's just, uh, it's so weird that like th- some of them have been killed in this state as like close as the seventies. That's actually like not that, it's not that far back. 
because these things are supposed to be extinct in like the 1800s so like to kill one in the 70s and then the dnr said all oh, that just came over from another state so it's it's weird every single time that there's like a sighting of one or they find paw prints of one or something the dnr is like nah it's not here I would have to say that maybe some of them, like reports of mountain lions and things in places where they shouldn't be, uh, some of those could be just like strange migration where they move into a new area or something like that and actually are there. But I think uh, a lot of these reports, you know, there are so many of them, I don't think that that could really account for that. So I don't think that it is just average sort of occurrences of animals being out of place. I think there is more of a, a folkloric thing going on there and uh, perhaps something else as well. So, you know, I don't really see the... Um, the rational explanation for some of these stories. Did you read the section in Strange West Virginia Monsters about the octopuses? Uh, if, if I did, I didn't read it recently because I don't quite remember it. No. Well, so refresh. There's me. been multiple uh, octopuses pulled out from the uh, Blackwater River. And it was uh, some, the first one that got pulled out, it was a hoax. It was someone doing a prank. But there's like no explanation for the other ones. Hmm. Uh, because no one could have like shipped an octopus into town without anyone knowing because they were too big. One of the theories that people have is there's a whole uh, species of like freshwater octopus that lives in the swamp near Blackwater River because like no one's really like investigated that swamp or anything. That kind of reminds me of like um, old newspaper clippings I've seen about like, you know, giant fish being caught in, in uh, rivers and things like that. You know, these sort of like really old newspaper clippings uh some of that stuff there's just no way to verify like you don't really know if any of that happened especially when it's like really yeah. old stuff and i do have to point out that like way back in the day the whole uh journalistic ethics were a little bit less so where people would write these kinds of crazy stories that would uh get people to buy the newspapers the, the same thing still essentially happens today uh, with less reputable places you know the whole people want you to click on things and the more clicks they get the more advertising revenue they get but a lot of those uh stories were like giant fish like i saw a fish this big sort of thing the less documentation the less verifiable it is yeah there are people who will still like a couple years ago i, I said something about the uh there aren't any you know 12 15 foot long catfish hiding in the locks and dam systems in the ohio river and like people backlashed against that uh telling me that they did exist and that they absolutely were at the bottom of the river and it's like there's no credible accounts of them at all yeah it, it does seem like the the fishermen's stories are like you know some fertile ground for folklore and things like that i mean typically when you think of that you do think of the idea of exaggeration like when someone comes home and tells you about the fish they caught but like i've read stories from like the 30s where people are talking about like a giant fish that ate their boat or whatever some of it also is kind of like pranks and then you know newspaper hoaxes yeah, like, um, not that far from where I grew up, people have claimed to call it, uh, piranhas in the river, but there's no actual, like, record of that other than, uh, some blog someone wrote on the internet. The only reference I found at the back of this book for it. So the thing I do have to say about that book is a lot of the sources are, like, paranormal blogs and stuff. And if you go to them, sometimes they'll get a 404, or it'll be, like, a sketchy website that'll probably give you a virus. Which is why I much prefer the older books. I like the, uh, when you cite your sources and it's like another book or uh, a direct conversation with the witness, like going straight to the source. Which is why documentaries are really good too, because not only do you hear the story from the witness, but you also see the witness on camera to verify this is an actual person. The um, Strange West Virginia Monsters, uh, it has a really cool design to it where it looks kind of like, uh, like a newspaper. Like yeah, it, like the Weekly World News. Yeah, it does. It looks very tabloid, but it has, um, I don't know how to describe that design, but it looks very like a newspaper, or like a magazine that you'd see yeah. sitting on a, a desk somewhere in a waiting room. It's, it's very cool looking. I like the design, yeah. even though it's kind of... That's what uh, drew me to it when I saw it on the shelf at the bookstore. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the books that I had uh, in the library when I first was looking into stuff like this. It was one of the books on the, the big shelf where all the Mothman books were in the library. So was there uh, anything else you want to say, though, uh, Best Virginian, about your book? Not really right off. Um, the one thing I like about it is it does go into a lot of the more rural areas, but, like, as far as the entire northern pain handle goes, it only has uh, two stories in Wetzel County and one in Tyler County. So, like, it doesn't go into, like, the penitentiary or the Trans-Allegheny or any of the uh, real main 
um, kind of haunt of West Virginia, which is the one drawback about it. But it says right in the forward that it focuses on uh, places that people can visit and travel to for free. So I understand why they left those locations out. And it also, um, they, they have a pretty good sense of humor about a lot of the accounts. They uh, kind of state that they don't want to take their job too seriously because uh, doing so would kind of detract from maybe some of the more casual, some of the more people who might want to just visit one of the locations while doing, you know, other uh, road trip activities and not, you know, a diehard, like, paranormal trip as a whole hmm. well that's cool because i definitely mm -hmm. prefer books that are uh written skeptically you know not written by true believers but not dismissive you know people who still understand the importance of folklore and of paranormal stories and of oddity and things like that but aren't like die hard like this is the truth no matter what and then if something is a hoax they'll say yeah that's a hoax but they'll still you know document it tell the story talk about it and then the things that you know none of us know the things that are up in the air that, that are unsolved just tell the story very cautiously and sort of give you the facts and tell you the legend as it's been written but not wholeheartedly believe but not dismiss it and say oh it's a bunch of nonsense when there's no direction one way or the other pointing to its truth or fiction you know yeah that's yeah. how i like to, the um... one uh, one part in it they're talking about um all, all the different places that the ghost of john brown has been seen in the eastern panhandle and uh it talks about how some people are skeptical that he could haunt five different places at once but of course why why couldn't he haunt five places at once like he he's john brown he's a major historical figure yeah that's awesome i know that um Typically, celebrities or like big historical important figures, they often are, are so important they get their own ghost. You know, like there is the ghost of Abraham Lincoln and people constantly report seeing Elvis everywhere. So if you're famous enough and if you're known enough and you uh, leave enough of an impression on people, I think people will start to, to see a spirit of you in, in some weird way. And, um, you know, there's some ideas you could have about that as the idea of people leaving like an impression, like a imprint or impression on people or the minds of the people and the, uh, you know, collective unconscious and the zeitgeist that brings them about in some weird way. Uh, in the same way, perhaps, that people have for their, their loved ones when their loved ones pass away and they see the ghosts of them in, in certain places. It could be if you want to talk about things in a parapsychological perspective. So I think that's interesting how historical figures and famous figures, they have their own ghosts. Um, also, I could say that if you think about it, the, the concept of a doppelganger is much the same as a concept of a ghost, minus the fact that uh, the person has passed away. You see, if someone can't be there because they're somewhere else, but they're still alive, that's considered a doppelganger. But if they can't be there because they're dead, well, then it's considered a ghost. People see apparitions of people that are still alive. The same thing could apply with the out-of-place animals. People could see apparitions of an animal that couldn't possibly be there because it's somewhere else, or couldn't possibly be there because it is extinct. And uh, people do report to see, um, you know, the strangest of extinct animals, including downright dinosaurs. So if you think about it in that way, in the, um, the idea of a ghost and a doppelganger, uh, either of humans or animals, as some sort of uh, psychological manifestation, then I think it kind of falls into place and makes a little bit more sense. That's my idea anyway. I'm, I'm trying to think, wasn't there a town over in the eastern part of West Virginia that at one point was terrorized by pterodactyls? Uh, there could be. Sounds like a cool story. Uh, not aware of that one. I, I'll have to look that one up. Yeah, well, sometimes people do see, um, you know, what they claim as pterodactyls, and sometimes people do see birds that appear larger than normal, and those are often called thunderbirds to tie into the Native American uh, lore. But, uh, you know, if it happens to be humanoid, then it's often called a flying humanoid or a winged humanoid. Uh, and if it happens to have red eyes, it's often called a mothman. So, you know, there's a lot of winged creatures can we get on the, the lists here, here and see who has uh, what book? Because I can say I have the strange West Virginia monsters, but I don't have your book there, Best Virginian. Uh, could you give us the title of that one again? Yes, it is um, A Guide to Haunted West Virginia. Okay, so I don't, I don't have that one. What, what about you, Best Virginian? You have that one? Do you have uh, either of the books we've mentioned? Yeah, I have the uh, Strange West Virginia Monsters book. 
actually on my desk over here in between my Ruth Ann music book. So Okay. And what about you, Micah? I don't have either of those, but I know the book that uh Best Virginian's talking about. I've seen it like at a Tamarack before. You know, is it a thick book? Is it a thin book? What kind of book are we talking about here? It's almost 300 pages. It's it's not a super thin book. Okay. Do you know uh, what year it came out? Uh, 2001. So it is a little bit older at this point. <laughs> well, well, that's funny. Considering uh, <laughs> my book is from 1986 and my other book yeah. here, the, the Kelly book I'm talking about is from 1978. And in my mind, those are kind of modern because <laughs> I read a bunch of books from like the 50s. Mm -hmm. so um do you know much about the the kentucky goblins there best virginian um i believe i have read a couple little things about it maybe watch a couple videos about it but it's not a topic that i'm super well versed in okay well i chose these two uh books because they kind of they have a similar theme in a way, even though, you know, the subject matter actually is different. The Goblin Universe and then the Kentucky Goblins. Um, but the Goblin Universe is this, you know, sort of overarching theory that Ted Holliday had. And then the, the Kentucky Goblins are, you know, actually reported to be goblin-like, you know. And one's way over in Loch Ness and the other one is right here in Appalachia in Kentucky, eastern Kentucky. The Kentucky Goblins are probably one of the most famous close encounter of the third kind, you know. There's also a Pokemon based off of it. Sableye is the Pokemon. I like to think that maybe the Gremlins who have their ears like that. I mean, I know Gremlins is also already a thing that was like from propaganda posters in World War II. But um, the whole ear thing makes me think that might be also like based on that. The guy who came up with Critters at least says that uh, he based it off of the Kentucky Goblins. Lilo and Stitch, the, the Stitch creature also has ears like that. But I'm not sure how much that goes down to like, you know, just fantasy and general design. I've always thought that Stitch looked like the Kentucky Goblins, but I can't find anything online like confirming it. I know that um, Best Virginian recently did a video going down the, the whole history of how the, the Flatwoods monster became popular in Japan and how that became the basis for a lot of video games and stuff like that. Yeah, that, that was a very unique study. Um, it turns out that the Japanese have like a super long history of not just folklore illustrating different mythical creatures and monsters and even ghosts and like categorizing them and uh, putting out publications of them, which is probably why they have uh, so many amazing kind of monster and creature um, designs, uh, very unique to their culture. And uh, yeah, that was just a very unique study and seeing all the different variations of the Flatwoods monster that has made it into uh, various forms of pop culture there and then that has made it back to the United States was really interesting to look into. You said that one of the things you mentioned in that video might have come from, you know, my introducing you to uh, UFO groups because you mentioned uh, APRO. Yeah, uh, two, I believe it was two or three years after uh, the United States had its first major amateur uh, flying Saucer Society, a Japanese flying saucer research organization was founded. So that that was a very quick kind of turnover um, as far as the adoption of flying saucer societies go. But really, um, there's a lot of tradition in Japan for especially spending summer nights kind of exploring like family cemeteries and family castles and stuff and then sharing kind of oral tradition stories and stuff. So whenever a new type of paranormal folklore was kind of introduced to them with flying saucers, they instantly uh, gravitated towards it and just added it to their paranormal activities instead of just going to cemeteries and family castles and stuff. Now they're looking up to the sky, looking for paranormal objects up there as well. So it, it was really interesting kind of some of those similarities and uh, readiness to adopt new forms of paranormal research. And actually, at one point, that UFO society sent a letter to the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was going to test a nuclear bomb on the moon. They, they were going to launch a nuke at the moon, and the Japanese talked them out of it for however they went about doing it, which is weird and fascinating, and I kind of love it. <laughs> 
I would say the the Flatwoods monster strangely does kind of fit in to the Japanese uh, collection of folklore and stuff like that. It has such a unique design. In the 1952 was a really big year for UFO. It, it kind of was like the second wave that made everyone interested. I know the Flatwoods monster was an international story. I know that it went over to different countries via the various UFO uh, magazines and newsletters and things like that. So I know it was a big story. So, you know, if you if you read Fate magazine, no matter what country you're in, you're going to be reading about the Flatwoods monster. So I see how it could, you know, jump from one country to the next. You know, UFOs really just did take over that year, 1952. It was a, a big year for the study. And then 1953 was when the uh, U.S. Air Force officially named the flying saucers as UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Because before that, everyone was just calling them saucers, no matter what shape they were. And that was very confusing. Yeah, 1952 was the year that Carol Lorenzen came up with the APRO, which was the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, which was based in uh, Arizona. And it's also the year that Al Bender set up his International Flying Saucer Bureau in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. So those two organizations both started that same year in 52. That's also when Gray Barker officially hit the scene with his article about the Flatwoods Monster, which ended up in the January 1953 edition of Fate Magazine. Fate Magazine being the, the famous uh, Ray Palmer magazine that was responsible for a lot of UFO uh, lore being more popularized. Uh, even the Kenneth Arnold sighting from 1947, that was like the first issue even that was like you know very popularized because of fate magazine the international flying saucer bureau closed down in 53 you know the whole men in black saga but apro continued on for for a long time it, it was a, a really good organization apro was 1952 to 1988 that's that's the the lifespan of that organization one thing you mentioned before in chat there micah was the uh not deer do you want to talk about that sort of story that we looked into like not too long ago yeah so it's basically just like of seeing a, like a deer that doesn't look like a deer and one of the theories is that it's something trying to like shape shift into a deer there's different stories with it but i don't i don't have like the full uh the full post off the top of my head right now okay well i'm i've got the our conversation about it pulled up here in the discord i was just saying i really like really obscure stuff like that that like no one's really talked about i like this stuff interests me a lot more than uh the bigger known stuff I actually hadn't heard of this one um, when you brought it up. So I looked into it, kind of went down the rabbit hole and came up with uh, what I think is the earliest uh, origin of that specific story, at least. You linked two Reddit posts. The first post was simply talking about the story. And the next one was like artwork that someone had made about the quote unquote not deer. And uh, the first Reddit post that was talking about the stories actually linked to a Tumblr page. And the Tumblr page was, um, from what I've seen, the original source because all of the artwork about the not deer takes place after that. And it sort of becomes a, a Tumblr trend of people making videos and um, artwork about the not deer. And from what I've seen, the, the earliest post is um, from August 21st, 2019. And I haven't found any um, artwork predating that or stories predating that. If you check the, the Reddit post, there is a bunch of people in the comments who are telling their own stories. So it could be sort of people recontextualizing stories that have happened to them to fit to this concept. But also just generally in folklore, anywhere where there are deer, there's bound to be like deer folklore. But this specific name for it, a not deer, and this specific story, it goes back to 2019. But the person who's telling the story says that, you know, there is people in the place where they lived who saw this creature so that would be sort of a, a collection of a folklore a modern collecting of a folklore story you know unless it is of course a fictional writing the author in the beginning says anyone who spends a decent amount of time in appalachia knows the not deer but then in the reddit post later they say i must admit the anyone in appalachia thing was about telling a good story and setting the scene than me really expecting anyone to know it so this seems like it's a very local story for this person that they have heard about in their town they used to live in because they say they they moved from the location so it seems like it's a it's a local story or you know depending on what you think it could be just a fictional story that's supposed to be made to seem real but um one of the correspondents here in the group, uh, Teresa, she actually posted her own story of a strange deer-like creature. So I do think there are a bunch of strange deer uh, stories out there, but this uh, category or this genre seems to be a, a new thing that has maybe spurred people on to 
to bring out their story of weird happenings in the woods with deer. So yeah, that's kind of how a lot of this stuff happens. Like eventually there'll be one sighting that will, you know, make people realize, hey, this is a category. And then a bunch of other signs will happen based on that. If you're looking for books or anything about it, I don't think there would be any. Because it seems to be uh, net lore, something that's uh, folklore that's spread about through the internet or that is first recorded or collected on the internet. Yeah, I think it also, um, people, I mean, deer are probably like the most common animal here. Mm -hmm. So like if someone's going to write folklore about something like spooky, it's going to be like probably the most common animal that you see all the time. When you're driving down the road uh, and a deer passes you, it, stuff looks weird, like, at the side of your headlights. Yep. Uh, the idea of a un uncanny, something that's not quite right, that is a, a very common idea. So you could go all the way back to, um, you know, Native American stories of different animals and things like that. So there, there definitely are, you know, uh, lore going back, like, as far as you can go, as long as there are the animals there, you know. Like, they have concepts of, like, coyotes as, like, a trickster, and then there's the concept of, like, a, a fox being, like, a trickster. So there has always been, in folklore, the story of the animal that's not quite right, or the animal that, you know, somehow isn't actually an animal. It's, like, a, a mimic, or it's, like, uh, pretending to be that animal. It's, like, um, an uncanniness. If you've read Stories of the Men in Black, it's kind of the same thing, but for people. Like, that person's not quite as they seem. They they could be a, an alien or something like that. So, you know, they're uh, dressed perfectly, except for one slight thing is off. They're, you know, it makes them seem surreal or uncanny. So the same thing applied to animals is a, a common trope that goes all the way back. But, you know, people talking about the not deer seems like it'd be a modern thing. But if I was going to take a guess, I would say that probably all over the country, there are weird stories about deer. But yeah, I just went down the rabbit hole on that. When you brought it to my attention, I'm like, well, I got to see this. If, if they're going to call it a, an Appalachian lore, I got to see what the, the earliest thing about it is. That's mostly what I do when I look into folklore is I try to find the earliest source. You try to find, you know, the eldest source that you can possibly find. Uh, and that's oftentimes the origin. Uh, sometimes it can be hard to find that because sometimes it's like in just a magazine or a, a newspaper column or something like sometimes it's very an obscure source but uh, if you can find a book that cites that source then typically you can find the origin. Yeah I think it's um, I think everyone you know here in really the Appalachians have some type of experience uh, weird experience with deer and especially with just non- threatening animals in general um i i was reading that original post and i i thought it was funny and i told a friend of mine um about the not deer and they're like oh yeah i've i've you know hit a deer one time with my car i i was doing like 50 and then it just walked away like nothing happened to it which is weird um and then i put something in there that whenever i first moved to morgantown we had this deer that would just show up in the backyard and it had back leg that was super mangled that uh, it probably got hit by a car or something. And I remember seeing it a couple times and thinking that this three-legged deer was weird. My roommate claimed that the first time they saw it, they thought it looked more like an arm than like a disfigured leg. And then I was like, oh yeah, I guess I kind of have a similar experience to what some of these other people are witnessing um a secondhand story that would kind of fit the same description of an animal not having parts that it should or having extra parts that aren't normal yeah it's definitely an interesting category i mean like i said it's it's kind of a recent thing that people are talking about so it could become like a big thing and then people could just share their deer stories all the time uh, so let me give like full credit to the author there that is their profile is will of the witch and their blog is Have a Magical Day. They seem to be a person interested in Jewish mysticism. They've also posted on Reddit, so I think I might um, try to contact them on Reddit. That'd be cool if I could, like, interview them or something. I actually do have a story not about a strange-looking deer, but a deer that came along at an interesting time. I was meditating in a graveyard, and um, right when I was about to be done with my meditation, I was about to stand up and leave. I suddenly start hearing these like noises in the in the brush and then I look out and this deer just wanders out from the the woods 
and just stands there like in the graveyard like I was sitting on a stump and it like walked right up to the stump and kind of like stared at me and then uh, I took a photo of it and it, it wasn't afraid of like people it didn't run off or anything I like walked around it you know I probably could have reached out and touched it if I wanted to but I just like did like a bow you know like a nice respectful bow and then the, the deer just like wandered off. So nice graveyard deer, uh, not strange in its looks, but strange in its placement and its timing. Don't deers get some kind of disease that like makes them act really weird, like messes with their brain? Yeah, it's um called chronic wasting disease. It's essentially like mad cow disease, but it affects deer and other um, antlered mammals. Okay, so is there anything else you, you folks want to talk about from, uh, I guess, recent stuff in the Mystery Society? Is there anything interesting going on with you folks recently? Nothing really recently. I've been trying to go on uh, more ghost tours. That's about it. What about you, Best Virginia? Have you been interested in doing, like, overnight stuff? Have you ever done that sort of thing before? Not, um, mostly because it interferes with my work a lot, but I have gotten, uh, the weekend of, if they do have the Mothman Festival this year, I did get that weekend off, and I think I'm going to, uh, head down through, maybe stay at the Blennerhasset Hotel in Parkersburg, and then head down to Fort Borman, just below Parkersburg. Take that time to explore some of the locations down there. Um, I know something that we were going to talk about uh, the next meeting that we can sort of go into a little bit here is um, I've been wanting to do the, uh, you know, the first official IRL meeting, the first official like in-person meeting because um, that was always the the main goal of the mystery society is to actually you know meet in person and things like that so that's something it's still a long-term goal of the society of course i have no idea how i would do something like that i was thinking about like renting out renting out some kind of space like a library space or just maybe finding somewhere where we could all meet up that was you know good for all of us uh you know travel wise so you guys have any ideas or perspectives on that while you're here in the call i'm, I'm trying to think of what a good generalized like central location would be for everyone here in the group I, I know as far as west virginia goes probably the most centralized location would be around the sutton flatwoods weston area that's kind of the central part of the state for the most part well there is uh you know there's the flatwoods museum down there there's the sutton lake where they reportedly have sasquatch sightings there's uh the Heyman house down there and then there's the new bigfoot museum opening up there so there's a bunch of stuff to do there i'm sure the guy that owns that the curator of the uh, flatwoods museum would be fine with us just like hanging out there for a day mm -hmm. i definitely want to see the new uh bigfoot museum that they're opening up you know i'm not sure like how much will be in there it seems like a kind of like a small space definitely want to see that i know they're doing the um the bigfoot festival on the 26th yeah i also would really like to go down and uh visit it i i guess it started out as part of just the uh, mountain laurel general store down there and it kind of just kept growing and kept growing until they kind of decided it needed its own space and uh they kind of expanded and moved it out to its own location and i i would really be interested to go down and uh spend spend an afternoon down there mm -hmm. i've seen they have uh the binders and the uh the plaster cast from Les Odell's research. Les Odell is a, a very good researcher of Fortean phenomena. He runs the West Virginia Cryptids and Strange Encounters Facebook page and uh, YouTube page. Yeah, he collects a lot of uh, interesting sightings and stories. He has one recently about this weird hyena-like creature that someone's seen. He also covered the uh, one of the stories of this Bigfoot that someone saw in Fayette County that had like some blonde hair on it. One of my followers, when I said I was, uh, I, I posted something about the Bigfoot Museum, and I wasn't aware of this, but there's actually like four or five different types of Bigfoot foots that have been seen in West Virginia. Everything ranging from kind of the more aggressive Yahoo to just the lurking about um, like Grant Town Goon. And I, I didn't know there were so many different subgroups of Appalachian Bigfoots. I'm not sure if there are any like you know, set in stone categories for them. But, you know, I'm sure there are different names that people call different variety of sightings and encounters, you know. My favorite's always going to be the, you know, the white-haired Bigfoot that doesn't really seem to make much sense, like the white things. There's a, um, a grill place, uh, like a restaurant called the um, Adventure Grill that has like a Bigfoot statue out in the front that's like a white Bigfoot. Either you've seen that place? 
I where, think I, I have seen some pictures so. of it. Where where is it at? Uh, it's in the Clarksburg area. It's this big like woodcut uh sasquatch statue and it's white and it's at the uh, ad- adventure grill i can't think of any time i've been around that area so nah okay well i always love seeing the um the garden sasquatches instead of uh garden gnome they have these big sasquatch in the you know classic pg pose yeah or like going out from behind a tree those ones as well yeah just just the more kind of lurking around uh curious Satch squashes. Yeah. Um, from what I've seen, though, from like looking at folklore and also it's sort of lined out in the um, on the trail of Bigfoot by small town monsters, they go into this. The idea that a lot of the Sasquatch stories from the West Coast, like from California and like Washington and stuff like that, are more of the lurking around uh, normal animal that's like curious and just, you know, wandering around or gets seen by hunters, things like that. That story comes from that area, but then as it moves over to the East Coast, it becomes more of this uh, monstrous, uh, glowing-eyed creature that will eat your dog or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, they, the more uh, monstrous and aggressive Sasquatch stories tend to come from that side of the country as the folklore sweeps across the nation. The Bigfoot story, like, starts in 1958, at least, with the whole concept of Bigfoot with Jerry Crew, who um, found the first uh, footprint that made it big. You know, the name Bigfoot comes from that. It was often called the California Bigfoot. Another name for it was the American Abominable Snowman, because it was, a lot of it comes from that lore from the Himalayas and stuff like that, tied together, of course, with the Native American traditions of the ape-like creatures, right? So as it goes from west to east, and the decades go on and on, especially in the 70s in the East coast that's when you get the ufos making their way into the sasquatch stories and those are my favorite i love those those are like some of the best ones where the the sasquatch have the uh supernatural glowing eyes and they there's ufos flying overhead i think that stuff looks really cool i want like poster with a sasquatch and a ufo overhead that's the kind of thing i'm going for and that just says more about the entire concept of high strangeness that there might be you know a, a lot of what's seen and reported might actually be more connected than a lot of people would want to believe Mm -hmm. Um, and even if you don't uh, you know buy into the concept of any of these things being real the stories still do have that overlap when we're talking about folklore and stuff like that you know even if you just consider it storytelling the whole ufo sasquatch thing definitely did have crossplay at some point especially in the 70s in you know chestnut ridge I've always found it fascinating just how much stories can affect people based off of even if what they see isn't real um and well even if there's no evidence to support they saw what they think they saw just the effects that that can still have on communities and individuals when you hear about like the the great monster hunts that happened around grafton after the sighting of the grafton monster Mm -hmm. or um the flatwoods monster you know how people would just come out of their houses and spend the next two, three nights run around in the woods just trying to see the, these monsters, these beings. It, it is fascinating how accounts and stories can really shape entire communities for years and decades to come. The, the same thing with uh, the good old Mothman. People were down there in the TNT area the very next night with all their yeah. cars like lining up in the TNT area, and uh, a lot of them had guns. The classic monster hunt always seems to happen when these stories start to go around. Oftentimes they, they look for the monster and they now they don't find anything. Um, that happens in some Mothman cases where the police show up and by that time it's gone. Um, that actually goes into the Kentucky Goblins I was mentioning. The police show up and the goblins are gone. And then the police say, okay, uh, we're going to leave now. You, you guys go to sleep. You have a good night. And then the goblins come back and start, uh, you know, uh, messing with the screen door again. When it can't be proven, there it is. When it can be proven, then it's not there. Uh, which goes into the Loch Ness Monster idea with um, Ted Holliday. He was saying that when they set up cameras in the Loch Ness, suddenly there'd be sightings in the places where they hadn't set up the cameras. And all the sightings in the places where they had set up the cameras would be gone. So the idea that 
these things uh, specifically avoid camera or specifically avoid detection in some trickstery magician kind of way. It's like how your car stops making that noise, stops acting up as soon as you take it into the garage. Like it, it can give you problems for weeks, but as soon as you take it in, there nothing happens, and then it breaks down on your way back home. Yep, I do kind of like the idea, or think it's plausible, the idea that the phenomena shrouds itself in mystery, specifically and doing that on purpose, this shrouding factor. To bring it back to the Goblin universe, which is uh, Ted Holliday's book, we're mentioning Sasquatch and UFOs. He talks about um, the Loch Ness Monster and UFOs, the, the dragon and the disc. And he talks about these things as shrouding themselves in mystery. And of course, the concept of the Goblin universe goes back to Sasquatch because uh, John Naper was talking about this idea of these um, sort of more spiritual side of these stories, and he was calling it the Goblin Universe. And, you know, he might have been doing that in like a tongue-in-cheek way, but still, that phrase caught on. How familiar are either of you with the actual happenings of the Kentucky Goblins thing? Because I could go down a quick summary of what that story is, if you'd like. I'm familiar with it. I'm not like expert familiar with it, but I, 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 I know what it is. I've read about it a lot. Best Virginian? Yeah, um... I'm I'm familiar with the idea that there was this family who kind of had a gun battle with these creatures that they couldn't explain. I think the the book I mentioned, the um, Close Encounters at Kelly and others of 1955. I think that's the best uh, book if you were gonna you know look in the subject and you wanted a specific book to read. I think that's the go to book. But the the story of the Kentucky Goblins, August 21st, 1955. Billy Ray Taylor and his wife were staying with the Suttons and the Lankford family at the Suttons' farmhouse. Billy Ray went to the backyard to get a drink from the well of water when he saw a silver flying saucer shooting flames of every color, which then went down into a ravine. He went back to the house and told the Sutton and Lankford family, including their friend Elmer Lucky Sutton. An hour later at 8 p.m., Elmer and Billy reportedly saw something which appeared to be a three and a half foot tall glowing man with large pupilless eyes moving along the shadows towards the farmhouse. The creature was silver and metallic in coloration and had large pointed ears, no nose, and thin arms with talon-like claws which it held over its head. Billy went for his 22 rifle and Elmer grabbed his 20 gauge shotgun. They fired at the creature from a distance of 20 feet. When hit, one of the small creatures flipped over and ran into the dark. The two men went inside only for one of the little men to appear in the window. They shot the entity through the window screen, and once again it disappeared into the shadows. By this time, the house was alert to the commotion. When Billy Ray exited through the screen door into the backyard, a clawed hand on the roofing above him grabbed him by the hair. Aline Sutton pulled Billy away and back inside to the farmhouse. Elmer rushed into the backyard and shot the creatures that were on the roof, causing them to strangely float off onto the ground. Another small man then appeared in the tree near the house, and another ran out towards Elmer. The creatures reportedly seemed to glow brighter when they were shot or yelled at. The families continued shooting at the advancing creatures for several hours before eventually abandoning the farmhouse at 11 p.m. and driving to the police station in Hopkinsville. Police and reporters investigated the Sutton Farm at 11.30 p.m. without finding anything after the crowd of people had left. At about 2 a.m., the Sutton and Langford and Taylor family were once again frightened by a glowing claw-like hand outside their window. Elmer once again shot the creature, which finally disappeared around dawn. So that's the, the full story there from my write-up that I have on my website on AppalachianOddity.org. And I just think that is, it sounds like a, a movie. It's crazy because at the end, you know, the monster comes back for one last scare. I guess when they're causing the creature some kind of pain, either physical or emotional, they're like glowing more. It's a, a weird concept, very sci-fi and strange. I, I, I do enjoy how they do try and blame it on uh, Great Horned Isles. Because I believe that's also what a couple people have accused the Flatwoods monster of being. Yeah, everything uh, is an owl. Just a giant owl. Yeah, which in itself also has a very long paranormal history in its own right. So The Mothman's called like a, a barred owl. Flatwoods mm -hmm. as well. And then the Kentucky Goblins. Goes back to that, uh, the, the owls are not what they seem. Yep. I don't see how anyone could read that and be like, oh, it was an owl. Like, they're talking about, like, glowing creatures with, like, claws over their heads. And it's also, you know, the, these people were in a very rural area. They probably can identify with wildlife on their own. They probably would have known if it was just some, you know, pest creature like an owl or 
something like that. If you're going to be like a dismissive person, just say, I don't believe you because there is no evidence of your claim. That's all you have to say. You don't have to say, actually, it was a, a black bear or actually it was a, a barn owl. It was a sandhill crane. You don't have to do that. You know, if you want to not take the story seriously, you just say no evidence. And we'll have to say, that's right. No evidence. That's kind of how I feel about those kind of explanations, you know. Everything is always uh, due to swamp gas, swamp gas and weather balloons. Yeah, but that's uh, good old J. Allen Hynek. He came up with that in the uh, the Michigan flap of 1966, which then led into the Ohio flap, uh, where the, the police chased down this UFO in the sky, and then that led into the West Virginia flap. And, you know, what's on the border of Ohio? Point Pleasant. And so the whole UFO flap happened there, and the Mothman was uh, caught up in the mixture of all that. I do need to post a picture of this map they had at the Grave Creek Mound, um of all the different prehistoric sites across West Virginia, because it is kind of fascinating to look at, like, the prehistoric sites and then how they're still sightings and kind of paranormal uh, association with a lot of those different places across the state. Okay, so I was going to say um, more about the uh, Kentucky Goblins there. Um, they kind of sound like a game of, like, whack-a-mole or that thing where you shoot at the, uh, the ducks on, like, a, a carnival game where they're kind of like they're flying back, you know, and they're like floating down and stuff like that. Also, I want to point out that if we consider this an actual battle between uh, human and non-human entities, it uh, seems like the non-human entities won because uh, they abandoned their farmhouse. So if this was a game of, uh, you know, holding the fort, if this was a game of tower defense, then it seems like they lost. What was... Uh... What was that show that came on a while back about the Kentucky Goblins? Yep. Hellier? Yep. Uh, you know, by the way, if you watch the end credits of season two of Hellier, they mention a certain someone because I went up to them and got them to sign my tin can and I told them uh, some stuff about John Keel and they included a little mention to me at the end of the season two credits. Cool. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I watched that because I immediately, you know, recognized that that would be a Kentucky Goblins thing. And uh, I didn't expect all the Mothman stuff, but there was a ton of Mothman stuff and a lot of John Keel stuff. It seems like somebody, uh, you know, started digging through my bookshelf and made a documentary out of it. So pretty cool. Definitely like exactly the kind of stuff I'm interested in, you know, the high strangeness and the Appalachian stuff. Very specific subject. So it's incredible that a, a documentary about something so specific that I'm interested in ended up being made and got pretty popular. Plus their Estes method thing. That's the one thing that I like hadn't really heard about that I think is really cool that I learned from that is uh, Estes method and also Alan Greenfield. I hadn't really looked much into him. So yeah, pretty good series. Anyway, so uh, do, you, do you have any other thoughts, uh, Micah, on the um, Kentucky Goblins case? That's all I can think of. Okay. Do you have any thoughts about the idea that uh, the Sutton family kind of lost the battle there? They had to abandon their fort? I wonder what would have happened if they would have uh, reacted differently. Like if they would have not shot at them, they would have just come out like, we come in peace, you know, see see what they would have done, try to talk to them telepathically or, you know, flash some Morse code at them or something. Turns into a Mars attack situation. Okay, well, I can ask you guys then, uh, what would you do if you were in your farmhouse and suddenly there were some spooky goblins in your backyard? What would you do? Probably uh, wouldn't react positively at all. Uh, I, I definitely like to be left alone. Um, that that applies to pretty much everything in this world and beyond. So probably I would have reacted pretty similarly. Okay, what about you, Micah? Uh, I probably wouldn't shot at them, but I definitely would have uh not got close to them. Probably I, try to document it. Yeah, I probably would have tried to talk to them telepathically. If I had a camera, of course, I'd point it there. But I feel like if I point a camera at them, they'd probably disappear. Uh, so I'd probably yeah. go out and uh, go out into the backyard and, and see what happens. You know, let them carry me away to their their UFO. But I'm a weirdo, so yeah, to take that into account. Um, the story also reminds me of some of the white things where, you know, they also shoot at it like the whole family just decides to grab <laughs> grab all of their guns. Um, there's a story where it's talking about, you know, they grab their guns and then they grab their guns and then the, the family member who lived down the street, uh, they heard about it and they grabbed their guns and started walking down. So I think those are kind of uh, interesting stories where everyone, you know, just arms up and goes, looks for the monster. That's just like an Appalachian thing. Like, yeah, <laughs> we just love to shoot stuff here. 
and plus i just love the the sort of the the living situation as well where it's like a farmhouse and the whole family like uh, multiple generations living there that's a, a very appalachian way of living as well you know yeah. everyone all piled together in one big farmhouse yeah, and I, I kind of talked about it in the video I did on the Flatwoods Monster, where I feel like at one point, you know, before modern technology, before Netflix, before all this, people kind of wanted for, you know, weirdness to happen. They they kind of wanted something out of the ordinary to happen, so they had something to do. Um, kind of that could have happened to you, you know, in the 50s and 60s was, was to see some strange light or to hear about some strange creature, you know, n next town over. And uh, a lot of the families back then had to uh, entertain themselves and entertain each other. You know, people used to gather around in the living room and, and sing and dance and play instruments and things like that. You know, the classic way of entertainment. There's a book. I got it at Tamarack. It was uh, Witches, Ghosts, and Signs by Patrick W. Gaynor. Got like a whole section in it about uh, like old rural Appalachia living, like all the activities and stuff that they would do. It's really interesting. Yeah, I, I've also seen that book around, but I've never had an opportunity to uh, pick it up. Uh, Micah, I know you said you also have uh, a book that's also in my bookshelf, uh, Dark Tourism. Yeah, I've actually got that one on my desk right now. Did you get some thoughts about that one? It goes back to me saying, like, I like the more obscure stuff that you don't really hear about that often. Uh, this guy goes everywhere. The guy that wrote this book, he went, like, absolutely everywhere. There's stuff in here I've never heard of before. He goes to, like, you know, he goes to Point Pleasant. He goes to Flatwoods. But he also goes to, like, George Washington's bathtub. It's, that's a that's a thing in here. It's, like, an outdoor bathtub that apparently George Washington used. There's a story in here about uh, Cheat Lake, the headless ghost of Cheat Lake. Yeah, he headless ghosts are a, a genre unto themselves, you know? Like, uh, you think of Sleepy Hollow and stuff like that. A lot of headless ghosts is a common thing. To a lot of the monsters, you know, Mothman is often seen as something with its, its shoulders arched up or its head down or, you know, headless with its eyes in the chest or sunken down. Um, the same with the Grafton monster is also seen as kind of headless or maybe like lurking with its head down. So it's a, a weird thing that happens perhaps to make the, the creature seem uncanny or to look strange. It's for it to be a different shape, to have that certain shape that's like headless. Have you been to uh, the Greenbrier Ghost Grave? Uh, yes, I have. I went about a year ago. It's really cool. The new grave they have actually says Greenbrier Ghost on it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the page I'm on right now. I'm looking at in the Dark Tourism book. There's a uh, section in this book about Webster, just all of Webster County because of the uh, werewolf sightings that go on <laughs> or Webster County. Pretty close to where I grew up is all the uh, the Mamie Thurman stuff. During Prohibition time, she it's kind of like the Black Dahlia. She got uh, murdered and left beside the road. And there's like a whole backstory to it. Uh, no one knows who the killer was. There's a lot of places around the world where like the road is kind of odd. So like if you put your car in neutral, it will drive uphill. And it's supposed to be like haunted. It's like that where the road where she's at, where she was found. That's a real interesting one to look into. Um, I know with uh, true crime, the thing that probably interests me most is the uh, unidentified people, the uh, the Jane Doe's and the John Doe's, because some of those people have headstones that just say, known only to God, or something like that, you know? So I find that an uh, interesting concept, the, um, you know, when people find unidentified bodies and they give them proper burials and the headstone says something like that. The Wetzel County Jane Doe has a similar headstone to that in uh, Payton City. She was found along, I believe, Route. 250 in between uh cameron and littleton and then a family um quote unquote adopted and gave her a proper burial there's a channel called mysterious west virginia that covers a lot of true crime stuff including uh jane doe and john doe stuff and uh, he's got a pretty cool channel check that one out i think i've seen the case you're talking about on that channel there's also a database called the lost and found database and it allows you to put a uh, missing person reports on one side of your screen and John and Jane Doe uh, profiles on the other side and I forget how many cases have actually been um, solved due to that resource because different agencies are responsible for each of those departments so before that there really wasn't a way to look at them side by side. So uh, looking at my bookshelf here, there's uh, also a book called West Virginia Curiosities. Have either of you read that book? I don't believe so. No, I haven't heard of that one. There's also uh, a book that's a very, like, sort of historical book. It's not, you know, as based on oddities. Uh, it's called It Happened in West Virginia. 
And it just kind of talks about interesting, like, historical events that took place in West Virginia. I think I read that one a long time ago. That that one does kind of jog my memory a little bit. Anything on your recommended list? So, okay. my recommended readings would be uh, A Guide to Haunted West Virginia by Walter Gavinda and Mike Shoemaker. Another that I would recommend is the Cold Cold Hand Stories of Ghosts and Haunts from the Appalachian Foothills. That's by uh, Burchill, Ryder, and Kendrick. And Abandoned West Virginia Rumbling Vignettes by Cindy Vasco. And the last one, Lunatic, The Rise and Fall of an American Asylum. That is from a pre-Civil War up until the closing of the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in Weston. A very good uh, short book on it. Okay, awesome. I haven't heard right. of any of those except for the last one, the, the Lunatic one. I have got, I've got that one. All the okay. other ones I'll have to check out. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. My uh, recommendations are always the same. It's uh, The Mothman Prophecies by John Keel, Passport to Magonia by Jacques Vallée, The Goblin Universe by Ted Holliday, and um, Silent Invasion by Stan Gordon. Those are all very high strangeness UFO books, though. All right. Another good book would be uh, Grassroots UFO by Michael Swords. He covers a lot of great UFO cases from his time investigating. He worked for the uh, Center of UFO Studies. Another book I have to recommend, which might sound weird because it's like science fiction, would be Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. The book is written based on his uh, looking into the paranormal as a subject, and so it's based on his ideas about that. He later went back on his paranormal notions and sort of um, disowned the ideas in the book and wrote like an introduction explaining that he no longer believes the things he apparently believed when he wrote the book. But the story is great. It's got UFOs, Ouija boards, these figures with wings and horns. Uh, it's quoted in the opening pages of the Mothman Prophecies, and John Keel recommended it several times throughout his work. Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, 1953. It basically describes the, uh, the final stages of man's evolution. So that's a book that people should read for its insight on UFOs and anomalous phenomena. I would definitely recommend that one to anyone who's interested in high strangeness. Charles Fort and uh, the study of anomalous phenomena as a whole has definitely had a uh, major influence on the science fiction field, and vice versa as well. Another weird book I have, it's a very thin book, it's called uh, Appalachian Case Study, UFO Sightings, Alien Encounters, and Unexplained Phenomena by Kyle Lovren. And it's sort of just a general UFO book about uh, UFO sightings in Appalachia. Also kind of an odd one is Monsters and Ghosts of West Virginia by Aaron Turner and Isaac McKinnon. It has a lot of uh, illustrations. It's a very thin book. It's kind of like a children's book. It has, you know, like some cartoons and a very brief summary of some of the um, most famous legends. I got this book donated to me. It's called uh, The Cold Cold Hand, Stories and Ghost Haunts from the Appalachian Foothills. And it's similar to like a Ruth Ann music book, but the stories are mostly gathered from like the Carolinas and Tennessee and like northern Georgia. So it's uh, an interesting read. Well, um, one thing I was going to mention is uh, I've been reading a bunch of correspondence between John Keel and Mary Heyer. And uh, there are a few stories in there that don't in end up making their way into the Mothman Prophecies. Stories that only they would know about, I guess. And a lot of interesting uh, tidbits. I can tell you about one that's really weird. It's unverifiable, of course, because it's just secondhand reporting from Mary Heyer, who heard it from someone, who heard it from someone. But apparently, back in you know 1966, uh, Mary heard a story of a student at the university who was picked up by a UFO in Camden Park. And inside of the UFO, he was forced to have uh, sexual intercourse two times with a space lady. Uh, I found that one of the correspondence, and I'm like, well, that is a, a strange one. That's definitely unique. There is a story in here from someone in the Strange West Virginia Monsters. Mm -hmm. uh, someone was to John Keel. Someone told John Keel about in Grafton. A uh, someone's dog had like its heart ripped out and ate, but it was like it was kind of just cut out. There was no other uh, signs of struggle or anything on the dog. They just like found their dog with like its heart missing. 
there, there was a lot of uh, animal mutilation when, when John Keel was studying things. Um, not sure how true it is, but he said that um, when he first talked about it, no one else was really interested in it. And, that, you know, the people in the, the UFO sphere thought he was making it all up. Then again, there might have been other people talking about it. You know, it's just what he said, what, what seemed like the case when he was first researching it. But yeah, the whole um, animal mutilation, it pops up in UFO stories. It pops up in Sasquatch stories, and it pops up now in the, the Jupacabra mythos. They talk about animals being drained of blood and like precision uh, cuts and like removing organs, but there's no harm to the, to the body and all kinds of weird things like that with, um, you know, cattle mutilation and just general animal mutilation. But anyway, I was going to say about that um, about that story. It, it's interesting that the you know the UFO touches down in Candon Park. I heard a story about there being like native burial grounds in Candon Park as well. Yes, there's actually I think two mounds uh, on the Candon Park grounds. Yep. All I know is that uh, when I went there as a kid, I was afraid of the the haunted house ride because there was like a witch that would pop out and scream which is kind of ironic now because now I love haunted houses and witches. But um, you can imagine like in the 60s with the whole uh, UFO craze that people were, you know, talking about that in the in the colleges and in, you know, the, all the teenagers and stuff like that. And that's kind of what that is with the um, West Virginia University thing, a bit of a, a rumor going around. And you got to yeah. remember the 60s were, were when the, the youth culture started to really be a thing and the whole concept of a teenager became a popular concept. Yeah, I, I guess one of the uh, Camden Park mounds is actually the third largest in all of West Virginia. So pretty pretty good size one down there. Uh, is the the largest one the, the Moundsville one, right? The largest properly surveyed one is in Moundsville, but yeah, there the Great is Creek. believed mm -hmm, there is believed to possibly be one. It's this hill that kind of is separated from everything else over around the Prickett's Fort area. That if it was ever properly surveyed, could be the largest one in I believe the East Coast. So yeah, I know you've been doing your studying of that sort of thing and traveling around to see what you can find there. I'll try and look up to see what that one's called. Uh, the ones I know is the, the Grave Creek Mound in Moundsville, the Krill Mound in South Charleston, and uh, then in Ohio there's the, the Snake Mound, the Serpent Mound. Which I, I've always wanted to uh, visit that one. And then the, the Cannon Park stuff, and that's pretty much all the ones that I know about. Anyway, so I was going to say um, about my correspondence that I was reading with uh, Mary Heyer and John Keel. I really think that um, one of the reasons that the Mothman and the, or at least the strangeness of Point Pleasant, uh, quote unquote, went away for a while uh, after the, the Silver Ridge collapse, I think it was partly due to the tragedy in the morning that would keep people away from folklore. But um, I think also it has to do with the fact that Mary Heyer uh, passed away in 1970. If you read the Mothman prophecies, there's a lot of weird stuff still happening that takes place after the bridge collapse, like the men in black visit Mary Heyer's office after that. And um, in the correspondence from 68 and 69, Mary is talking about, you know, people still seeing these strange lights in the sky. She talks about UFO sightings, and, you know, she tells more and more stories. So I don't really think the strangeness went away after that. I think the strangeness only went away when Mary Heyer uh, was not there to record it anymore, not there to um, be the eyes and ears for John Keel. Because John Keel didn't go back down there until 2003 at the Mothman Festival. You know, John Keel didn't return to Point Pleasant until the unveiling of the Mothman statue. So if uh, there would have been reporters down there, you know, talking about it, and John Keel could have got word of it, there probably would be more to the story, I think. Because we think about, um, you know, folklore in, in times of, of tragedy. Folklore doesn't really go away because of that. Sometimes, in fact, it tightens, right? De definitely during times of tragedy, it seems like accounts can kind of get amplified as people, again, be it just general stress put on them by the tragedies or maybe lack of sleep or something does cause them to kind of be uh, hyper aware of their surroundings and it does kind of lead to more um, at least seeing weird activity going on. 
Yeah, so the idea that the Mothman and the weirdness would somehow go away with that doesn't really seem to make much sense. And if you read some of the correspondence, it doesn't seem like it really did. It seems like that's just like a cap that people put on to the end of the story. So this is where the story ends, right? But the story does continue until Mary Hire passes away and then there's no more story to be told because there's no one to tell it. That's kind of how I look at it. John Keel, he went off to write his book, Strange Creatures from Time and Space, in 1970, and he wrote that chapter about the Mothman. So, you know, that's when he started writing his books in the 70s, and then he finally got the full story out there in 1975 with the Mothman Prophecies. But by the 1970s, I think that's when Keel starts to write about the story in past tense and says, okay, this is a story now. He even says in a letter he wrote that could become legend, like the Flatwoods Monster, you know, it could become folktale part of UFO history as well. I think it, it really finally ends in the 70s, 1970, and when it starts to pop back up again is in the 90s when the book gets reprinted, the Moth Prophecies gets reprinted, and in the 2000s when the movie comes out. So I really do think it's when the eyes are on the people is when, you know, people start to notice the strangeness, because when people aren't documenting it, then it's not there. So I think that's probably why it's more of a reporter-based documentation is the reason why these stories, um, they continue to hear the, the weird stories. Yeah, I know no one wants to be the one person reporting weirdness. Like, yeah. no one wants to be that person. But if other people are uh, reporting, or if it's just in the general, like, consciousness, I think people are much more willing to come forward with their own personal account. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, Mary Hire was aware to be looking out for things. I think that's why... She was so good at uh, documenting the stuff. And uh, after her passing, there was no one around who was like in the area who was aware to, you know, know what to look for. And, um, you know, as quickly as the snowball can run on the mountain and get things going, uh, they can also go the other way and, you know, things can fall apart. I, I do look at UFO waves and strange activity waves with that mentality that um, really it's just giving the people permission to tell their stories, to, to give them the permission to imagine and uh, that's probably why, you know, you see these clusters of sightings is because now it's uh, socially acceptable to tell your UFO story because everyone else is as well. So that's my sort of ideas on the whole, whole notion of uh, Mothman and strangeness just disappearing after the, the ridge collapse. I don't think that's the case. I think uh, it continued on for a while until, you know, it was no longer able to be reported on. Um, have either of you read uh, Jeff Wamsley's books, The Mothman Behind the Red Eyes and Mothman Behind the Legend? Uh, I read the first one. I have both of them, but I haven't read the uh, other one yet. Yeah, well, he goes back and sort of updates some of the stories and clarifies things from the witnesses and also finds witnesses who hadn't been interviewed. But um, he goes back and finds stories that hadn't been told before. He collects a lot of the newspaper reports together. And uh, it's a very good um, addendum or a very good resource to add when you're doing, when you're looking at the Mothman prophecies and the other books about Mothman. But um, yeah, Mary Heyer was uh, hospitalized in January of 1970, and then she passed away in February 15th, 1970. So the 1969 was really the, you know, the last year that she was uh, able to be out there documenting things. She was um, the person who got John Keel a lot of the stories, and that's why the, the Moth and Prophecies is dedicated to Mary Heyer and the people of West Virginia. I assume both of you have read the, the Moth and Prophecies, right? For me, it, it has been a while. I think I read it whenever the movie first came out. So, what, 15 plus years ago? I haven't finished it, but I have it. Yeah, but you guys are familiar with that sort of um, the notion of that Mothman uh, vanished after the, you know, the bridge yeah. collapse. Yeah. Um, that's actually said in the end of the movie. I think that might be one of the reasons why people hit on that so hard is the, the end of the movie um, says Mothman was never seen again, but, you know. You know, once there was someone there to report it, someone like Jeff Wamsley and the later people who came along, suddenly here's all the activity again. Uh, not to the extent, not to the like the same height as uh, it was back then, but still some, especially like in the 90s and 2000s. Um, I talked to a lady at the um, coffee grinder, which is now Bunker 304, uh, like a gift shop. But it used to be the coffee grinder. There was a lady there who worked there, and she was an older lady, who said that in 1968, her mother ran into the Mothman, and that's exactly how she phrased it. Like, she's like, uh, like, oh yeah, my mother ran into the Mothman. Like, she said it like it was meeting a celebrity or something like that, you know what I mean? And uh, so that, that really uh, freaked me out a bit, like, uh, you know, struck me when I was in there, like, buying stuff, and she just offhandedly said that like it was nothing. And I had to ask again, like, wait, like, what, what, what? she ran to who? <laughs> and she's like, she ran to the Mothman. 
And um, apparently her mother was pregnant at the time. So I found that a, an interesting note in, you know, UFO lore. People talk about that. But um, yeah, so that actually happened to, to me at the, the um, coffee grinder is um, people, you know, still sharing stories that happened uh, supposedly after the bridge collapse. So there you go. Okay, w- one more thing I was going to say on uh, the Mothman mythos is that um, the concept of Mothman being related to the Silver Bridge was something that the locals at the time were speculating about that. John Keel, however, in the book, he uses it kind of as a metaphor. He says that um, like some great specter of doom, the Mothman and the UFOs and the Men in Black had focused everyone's attention on the town of Point Pleasant. Those same reporters would be back there one year later on that fateful December or something like that. So he was essentially saying... You know, he ties in all the all the activity. He doesn't just say Mothman. He says these UFOs and, you know, the strange men and the, the Mothman as well. He's saying that all of it focused people's attention on the town and that it's ironic that those same people would be back there later to report on the collapse. So he doesn't really tie it together as much as he does make a, a metaphorical statement. And I think that paragraph then kind of became the basis of that movie, that you know, the 2001 Moth and Prophecies movie. And just because, you know, the happenstance of that sort of uh, event occurring in a town like that after that, John Keel in those books also kind of says that Mothman's a bit of a distraction. He says that the UFOs were the, the real big phenomena and that was the, the real focus. So um, that's interesting that he viewed it that way, considering he's, you know, known so much for it, and he ended up writing the book about it. He seemed to think that the UFOs were the, the quote-unquote real activity to, to worry about, and the Mothman was uh, kind of a, a red herring or a sort of magician's trick to make you look over here while this over there is happening. Any, any other uh, strange reads you guys got? Or should we end it off now with uh, the quotation I wanted to read as we end this off? I don't really have anything else. Nope, I, I think that bout does it for me as well. Okay, I'll end this off now with uh, two quotes from uh, my chosen book, The Goblin Universe. Truth is an actor who vanishes through a secret door in the stage scenery when we reach out to grab him. All he leaves behind is a sardonic chuckle, which we record, take away, analyze, and debate. But we never see his face. The Goblin Universe is the place in the play where the actor switches one mask for another. Suddenly you have the weird sensation of falling through the floor. The lights change color. The clocks are all wrong, and the villain who died in Act 1 is alive and well again. That's Ted Holliday from The Goblin Universe. So I want to thank you guys for joining me on this conversation about books and other strange topics. Thank you very much. Best Virginia and Micah, have any final words? Uh, nope. Nope, just thanks for having me again. It's always fun to do these whenever, and uh, hopefully eventually we'll be able to have one of these in person. Indeed, that is definitely the long-term goal. Signing off, on behalf of the Appalachian Mystery Society, Mountaineers are always free.